All right, take your Bibles. I'm going to think that the best place to start for you this morning is Luke chapter 12. This is simply, um, I tend to title one of the messages either this Sunday or the next. This year is going to be this Sunday, a New Year's message. And I think it's largely pastoral in, in its presentation, meaning I'm just going to talk to us largely like a the church family with some vision about what God has for us and, and what we think the Lord is doing. And uh, anyway, I want to give you some uh, direction that way. Uh, there are basically three um, points in the message, all starting with the letter P, planning, passion, and purpose. I often turn to uh, a verse that I memorized as a teenager when I think about looking over the past year and looking at what's coming in the new year. Uh, Proverbs 27.1 is one of those verses. Proverbs 27.1 is not where I've got you in Luke 12. We'll get to Luke 12 in just a moment. But in Proverbs 27 and verse 1, it says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Isn't that true? So what's, what's it saying? Be careful about all the things that you say you think you're going to do. Because you may not actually get them done. Uh, because you don't know what's going to happen in a day. I'll give you a for instance. Um, last night, our family is practicing for an offertory today. Uh, so we have four that we're going to play. You got me and uh, playing the guitar, Kaylee on the cello, and Bethany on the viola, and Heather on the violin, and, and mom on the banjo and drums. No, never mind. Anyway, but, uh, but that's, that's what we got going on in the house. And we're practicing, making sure we're ready. And we get up this morning, and Kaylee is uh, crawling out of bed uh, with pain, not able to walk to the bathroom. And she is getting help getting dressed so that she can be here to do the offertory and everything that she's got going on looks like an appendicitis. Uh, but it, we don't know. So, uh, so off they are to the, whether it's the ER or urgent care. And did we see any of that coming? No. And it's just the nature of life. You know, it's just the nature of, of how things go. You don't know what's going to happen from one day to the next. And I got an email. So some of you are on the prayer uh, list of Ken Dua, our missionary to Ghana, West Africa. He was in an accident recently and still recovering, has a hurt back as a result. Uh, I said, I don't, I don't know why I did it, but I got his, I was asking him some questions and getting further detail. And I decided I'd just send him some pictures of my accident as well. And so we could all be in a club together, you know. Um, but, it, you know, you just don't know what's going to happen, but you do know that you've been given today. And in giving today, I think it's really important that we as a church, which is going to involve you as an individual, asking some pretty important questions about your life. Now, planning is the first point of uh, this message this morning. And I want to encourage you to have a plan that has eternity in view. And that's really what we're focusing on in this first point, a plan that has eternity in view. And I have you in Luke chapter 12. In Luke chapter 12, I'm going to ask you to read out with me Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 21. Luke chapter 12, verses 16 through 21, give you a moment to get there. So are there things that have happened over this past year that you didn't expect? Are there? I'm going to tell you standing here today, a year ago today, I know we say it a lot. It's just kind of a running joke in the church, but I did not expect to have a rabbit as a part of our house, <laughs> but we do. Who knew? Um, matter of fact, a year ago today, I don't think, I don't think a year ago today, uh, did we know that Jacob and Lydia were they dating at that time? I don't think we knew at that time. Uh, maybe they were. Uh, but here, you know, this last year, there's a wedding. And, and if you know anything about my family, you know, there uh, is also in our family the expectation of our first grandchild this coming year. So there's, a, there's you know, you just don't know all these things are going to happen. If God gives time, things are going to happen. And as we consider those things, the Bible is pretty clear about making sure that we're prepared for eternity. So none of us has a crystal ball. Be careful about everybody else that tells you that they're a prophet and they know what's going to happen. Give it time and you'll find out if they're a prophet or not, right? 
okay? But in Luke chapter 12, verse 16, if you would, read verses 16 through 21 out loud with me. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward who? So the focus on where our planning for eternity should revolve around, that focus is who? In this passage, the target's God. Why? Because all this stuff isn't what you're going to take with you. And uh, all of us have, in some degree or measure, stuff that we're stewards of. Some of us may have more stuff than other people, but it's still stuff. I don't know why I saw yesterday, but I saw, I saw some graph that showed, I think, from like 1990s up to like 2020, the top 10 richest people in the world, and it goes through a graph timeline year by year, and it has the graph of, of those that have gained affluence and those that have lost it, and, and it's just almost a revolving door of those that eke their way up the list and then those that come back down. And, 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 you know, the numbers may be different, but that's the nature of our lives. Our financial situations change. And you know this, that one day can change everything. So the Bible's admonition is to be careful that you're not living for your stuff. And do we put a lot of care and time into our stuff? Do we? I would say we do at the Estes house. I had a project this summer where I, I have a shed and I figured it wasn't enough space. So I put a lean-to on my shed and now I can cover more stuff, okay? So, but it's, it's stuff. Then I do think that if, if a match was to go to all of it, I don't know that the world would miss any of it. And really, when you think about all the stuff that is surrounding your life, this is what God is warning you about in your focus. That all of the things that you have and the ambitions that you have to have things, that you don't get deceived by the idea that things either will satisfy or count for eternity. So... God gives an admonition here, and the admonition is very gospel-centric. Uh, I, I find it interesting. Now, who's the richest person in the world? So, some would say Elon Musk, and I, I think that that may be the case today. Have you been following Elon very much lately? No. I have. I have, because he's, he's not happy. And I've just been listening to him not be happy. And, you know, some of the things he's not happy about, I'm like, hey, he's, not, he's, he's, he's on the, the right page of not being happy about some of those things. So I'm like, hey, that's interesting. But what, what you find is that you come back to this lesson again and again, and I'm going to say it, and you're going to know the amen to it, that our satisfaction in life isn't about how much money you have. Amen. It isn't about the size, thank you, it isn't about the size of the house. It isn't about the car. You know, I, I also, uh, I forget who I was, it was either Charles Barkley or Shaquille O'Neal. One of those guys. Uh, I listened to Shaquille O'Neal talk about, it, it's, it's his rookie year of basketball. I think he signed for $20 million. And he had never had that much money in his life. And all he knew, he was a millionaire. And so when he went out and he bought and he bought, I forget how much his house was. His house might have been $3 million. And then he, I think, I, I don't remember the details specifically. I think it was a Rolls Royce. He went to a car dealer. And, and the dealer, uh, when he was talking to him about the car, the dealer said, are you sure you can afford it? 
And he puffed up. I, we call it roostering up. He roostered up and he's like, I'll buy three. <laughs> and he did. He bought three. And his agent at some time stepped into his life and said, you realize you're spending like crazy and you're going to run out of your rookie year paycheck. And out of that 20 million, you're going to get 10 and you're almost through it all in three months. Now, could you imagine spending 10 million in three months? Well, what you know is that you can. And here's the point, and I, I don't remember which guy it was, but he was talking about, there's another guy talking about living in a house, and he, he got into that house, and, and you know, when he first stepped into that house, it was like, man, I can't believe I live in this place. But he said, you know what he came to learn? He said, any place is just a place. As long as you have a place to sleep and that can meet your needs, it's just a place. But America... And many of us can live with the idea if I just had a this, if I just had a that. And what you recognize is that Satan can use those distractions of things to distract you from the greatest need that you will ever have. And what you have is at the end of this passage, the revelation of that need. And it is this, so is he that layeth up tre treasure for himself and is not rich toward the one who matters, God. And so what this life is about is God working in your life so that you can become rich towards him, rich in mercy, rich in grace, rich in forgiveness, rich by becoming an inheritor of the, uh, with the saints in light of Jesus Christ. And all that spiritual lingo means this, Rich toward God means you become one of his children. And as one of his children, he grants you all the inheritance of the saints. And that is it, to be with him forever in heaven. From what we see in scripture, to walk on streets of gold, where material things are not what's important, but God himself. And to have all of your sins washed away, to be forever in heaven with Christ. That's the promise that God offers for everyone that would come to know him. But what you have today is many people who won't entreat God at all because they're distracted by the next thing. And I'm just telling you, folks, I'm just saying what you already know. Things will not satisfy. So God wants you to be rich towards him. So there needs to be a planning in your life about your soul. There needs to be a planning in your life about how you meet the need of your soul to be right with God. Now, I, I don't know about you, but I, I, do, you, do you have to take care of your stuff? What kind of things do you have to take care of? I would say everything. You got a house? Do you sink money in that? How much does a new roof cost? Furnaces are cheap. Yeah, you should take a look. If you've been in a house for some time, you start thinking about, I got to paint the walls again. I got to replace the windows. Got to replace the roof. What about cars? I just want to witness today. Anybody got a, anybody got a car with an engine light on? <laughs> right? We're in the club, right? Have you looked at your tires lately? So if you have a car, what do you have to do with it? You have to keep taking care of it. And we're not even going into the world of animals. <laughs> Monkeys, what are you doing, Bert? We don't need a monkey. What are you talking about? Everything has need. Everything takes care. Everything takes time. And it's not like God wants you to sit on a mountain with your hands folded and, and in prayer all the time as if that's what worship is. But God does want you to walk with him on this planet. And the most important thing you can do is know the forgiveness that Christ offers you so that when this life ends, you're prepared to meet Christ as your savior and not your judge. Now, Matthew 6 talks about the materialism and 
you know, thinking about, I gotta, I gotta think about my clothes and I gotta think about my cars, or it doesn't use cars, but I gotta think about all these material things and the food I'm gonna have and, and, you know, and all the worry that we can put into that. But many of you have memorized Matthew 6, 33. But that verse says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And really his righteousness, I'm just gonna paraphrase it this way, and being right with him. And he says, and all these things will be added unto you. So I want to ask you a, a sincere question. Has God taken care of you this past year? Now, that doesn't mean that there's not need here. Some would say, well, I've gotten sick and maybe you've even lost loved ones. But here's, here's the thing, that God in his goodness sends sunshine and rain on the just and the unjust. If you're here today without Christ, he's been good to you anyway, even without your gratitude. He's given you life, breath, ability to make decisions, to walk on this planet, to, to seek him. He's given you everything you've got, and you may be wholly ungrateful and not even know him. But he's still been good to you materially to meet you where you are, to give you provision for your need, even if you don't know him. But God's great desire is that everyone in his will would come to know Christ personally and receive the gift of salvation that he offers you and to know what it means to have someone who can truly wash every sin away. No money can buy that, and, and, and that's a great equalizer. Everybody on the planet has sin, and everybody needs to do something with it. And there's only one person who can, and that's Christ. But if you come to him, he promises that he will wash your sin as white as snow. He'll remove it from him as far as the east is from the west. In other words, he'll forgive you and bring you into his family. Why? Because that's who God is. We, we reference it all the time by John three sixteen. You know it, you can say it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27 and 28 tells us, it is appointed unto man once to die. And you know how that verse ends. How does it end after that? But after this, the judgment. So there is an accountability that God tells us that every individual will have with God. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin. And it ends with these two words, unto salvation. Folks, the great promise that we have is there's a redeemer coming. And if you know him as your savior, he is your redeemer coming. And the doctrine of the Bible is this, the Lord Jesus is coming back and either we are going to die, those who know him, we're either going to die and go to him or if he comes, he's going to come for us. But the Bible says that everyone is going to have a meeting with God. And it is appointed unto man once to die. And after that, there is the judgment. So what God has done in his grace is through his spirit, he is working in the world to draw people to himself, to make their awareness known of the need of a savior and giving you opportunity to respond to him now before it's eternally too late. And if it sounds like there's pressure and that that, that, that is, uh, uh, you know, alarming, it, it, is, it is truly thus. Because God wants you to respond to the offer of salvation in his grace and become rich in his grace and mercy, receive it so that he can wash your sins away. He offers that to everyone. James 4, you can turn there, James 4. 13, I'm actually gonna read 13 through 15. James 4, 13 through 15. I'm going to read it for you. Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into a, such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. You need to be careful about those sentiments because, verse 14, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. 
Do you know what's going to be tomorrow? Do you have plans for tomorrow? You know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? Read it out loud with me, verse, the end of verse 14. It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that you ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. So here, here's the point. God is the only one who knows your tomorrow and if, if there even is a tomorrow for you. So I got a question for you. How much time do we spend worrying about tomorrow? Do you? Do you put a lot of energy into your tomorrow? Now, there have to be plans and stewardship, and I get it, and we all need to have plans uh, of what we're doing as good stewards of both our resources and time. But if you've lived long enough, you've seen those plans turned upside down. And I often ask it this way. Uh, you know, I... Uh, let me ask you, you know, think back to when some of you are, aren't even this old yet, but think about for you older folks when you were 18 and look at your life where you are right now. Did you expect that you would be where you are today? I often think about that with Idaho. I had no idea I would be in Idaho when I was 18. Matter of fact, when I was 18, anybody else do this? I often wondered if I'd lived to be old to be 30. Anybody do that? And then when you hit 30, you're like, I wonder if I'll live to 40. <laughs> and then maybe you hit 40 and then it's like, oh my word, I wonder if I'll live to be 50. So there's all this wonder about your future. And God is the only one that knows. But in planning, the number one thing that you can do for your soul's sake is plan a meeting with God because he's already got it on the schedule. And it's a meeting that maybe for the first time in your life, you will not be late for. You will show up on time when God calls. So that meeting is for everybody, saved and the lost. But it begs the question for the lost, are you prepared? And it begs the question for the redeemed, this next question, there's planning, but then there's passion. And that is this question, what are you living your life for? Let me ask you, do Christians get distracted from eternal purpose and get distracted with the here and now and lose focus on laying up treasure in heaven? Do we? I know I can, but I also know this, and I use the word passion here, one, because it was another P, and fit by outline. But I use it because I'm going to be over in Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. So I invite you to take your Bibles over there with me. Ephesians chapter 4. What drives why you do what you do? And I, I just use this principle. Passion wins. What you really want to do is what you will put your hands to. It's what you will be ambitious about. It's what will drive you to the decisions that you make. So it's the thing with Pastor Phil and I, <laughs> we talk about all the time. We, we use this phrase, passion wins. So we'll be discussing, and what, when we say passion wins, what we're really saying is, hey, I, I'm not passionate, or he's not passionate about something. So if you are, uh, let's go for it, because I, I, don't, I don't have any passion that way. But sometimes it's not that way. Sometimes when we're talking, I will start the conversation with, now I'm passionate about this. And often what I'm saying with that is, know that I'm already invested in what I want to do, so you got to talk me out of it. And we do that back and forth, but that's, it really is true that passion drives us. And, and we're trying to follow the Holy Spirit's leading. We're not trying to be passionate about what we want to do as a church, we need to be passionate about what God wants us to do. And that has to be the focus of what fellowship is about, not only as a body, but that happens as it's true individually. So there are things that we undertook to do that we became passionate about because we believed that they would help us in our ministry for the glory of God. We put a grass field in and it cost money to do that. Uh, we put young people into uh, 
mission field contexts. We brought people here in ministerial contexts, all because we were passionate about those things. But I want to tell you, being passionate about something doesn't necessarily make a person right. We need to be passionate about the things of God. And if we lose sight of that, we become just a social club and just another place that has four walls and heating and air conditioning. And I'm telling you that God, if we are not passionate about the things that he's passionate about, I don't think God has any interest in keeping the doors open on a place like that. It has to be about him. But in Ephesians chapter 4, we read some of that passion in verse 1. I therefore, and Paul's talking from prison here, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you, that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Now, I've just defined some words here under this uh, first verse to help us understand it and unpack it. To walk in the New Testament meant to live. So when the Bible says, Galatians 5, 16, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh, it means to live in the spirit. It is the idea of always continually living after the influence of the Holy Spirit, just to take a verse. But where you find walk in Scripture, that is the idea. This is what the way you're living. Okay, so when it says, I therefore the prisoner of the Lord beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called, what does it mean to walk worthy? It means to walk suitably or appropriately to one who names the name of Jesus. Now, this is just a question, and I'm, I'm not here to be the judge of the planet, but we all are taking a spiritual barometer and test of, of what is going on in the world around us spiritually, and I'm just asking you, do you believe that Christians today are walking more worthily in their walk with Christ or less. And, and it's, it's your judgment, it's your assessment, but I know this, that our carnal man is bent to going away from God. And we're not unique as a generation, and we often think that we're the most wicked generation, and I, I, I would just say, There's a lot of history that says generation after generation has had their own exhibition of wickedness. But what drives you in doing what you do is the passion behind you. And the passion behind you is what you're living for. Now, Paul's admonition is to live in a worthy fashion of one who names the name of Christ. And the idea behind that is not what's happening in this building. What happens in the world around you. And the truth is, everyone you know ought to know that you, by the world's definition, would be considered a fanatical for Jesus. According to the world's standards, they ought to see every one of us as religious Nuts, because we love and live for Jesus. But I, I do think this is true now, and, and I know there's so much in this, and I'm, it's not my purpose to unpack all this stuff today. But it does seem to me that it's harder to identify Christians today. It does seem that way. And what I'm saying is if someone, let's just pretend that whoever it is that that's, uh, we want to put in this picture, let's say that uh, they come alongside you at work and they have another employee and uh, another person in that workplace and and uh, in that meeting of those three people, these, these two workers already work together, and there's this friend that comes in. And this friend says, hey, I'm glad you know this person here. Did you, you know, I feel like they're, they are one of the most dedicated Christians I know. In that, in that illustration, it would be a shame if the coworker was to say, really? I had no idea. And that's what I'm talking about. It, when we walk worthy, the word, the word vocation here is, the, is another word for calling. It's also meant to be invitation. 
If you've responded to the invitation of the gospel, you have been called. And in that calling, God calls you to walk in a life that is in fellowship with him. And he says, walk worthy of that. And, and let me say, folks, I, I don't think we have to stand up here and give, you know, a litmus test of standards. But I'm going to say our standards as believers should be different than the world around us. Do you agree? And I'm going to tell you as well, more and more today, I think you're going to find that if you live godly in Christ, you're going to find a lot of believers who don't relate to you as well. So I'm just saying, don't be surprised by what other people think, but other people are not the standard. It's what is your life about? What is your passion? So I'm going to give you a couple illustrations here before I uh, go any further. I forgot. I meant to bring it out. But on my, on my, anybody know what's on my walls in my office? Say it again. What'd you say? You're not saying it right. It is a big elk. <laughs> it's got to be one of the biggest elk in the world. It's the biggest elk in the world in that office anyway. So there's something else on the walls in my office. Anybody else know what else is on the walls in my office? Two, and I'll grab it. <laughs> I didn't say it, sweetheart. Some mean person, some mean person said that. <laughs> uh, it, there are two big fish, and I'm not even sure I know what they are. I think one is a walleye and one is another fish. <laughs> but they're on my wall because they're big and they're friends and I want to see them there. And, and uh, I, I, I know this about the elk on the wall and the fish on the wall. Neither one of those things get there without going hunting or without going fishing. You actually have to have a goal to go. You have to have a desire to go. And I'm still reminded of my wife when we were first married. Uh, I don't know what this is called, but you go out at night and somebody showed me how to do it and you put, you, it, it was a flood irrigated lawn and you would go out with, at night with a flashlight and you'd try to catch worms to go fishing the next day. I did not know this for years. My wife is out there, we're, we're married, you know, six months or so and she's out there and she's out in in this water in this field trying to grab worms and every time she go oh I missed oh I'm, they're so fast I found out years later she never had any intention whatsoever <laughs> at all I was the only one trying <laughs> Why? Because if fishing meant doing that, no. There was no passion there. But passion drives what you do. Your desires drive what you do. Now, understand this, folks. Please, please be careful about this. Please be careful about the false piety that says, you know, Christians are so rigid, they can't do anything, and it's all about rules. And You know, I, I, there is freedom in Jesus. Go have fun in life and serve the king of kings. I watched two young people. Uh, I didn't watch them. I just saw the picture. They, two young people, graduates from, I think they're both graduates from college now. They jumped out of a perfectly good airplane uh, and, and did the, the parachute thing. Not my cup of tea, but good on them. They went out and they did something because they, they wanted to and they wanted to have that experience and and you know, I, I think God's given you liberty to do things in life. Go enjoy the life that God's given, but do it with God in view. Do it with God in view. And let God use how he's made you and gifted you for his glory. Live a life worthy of the calling you've been called to. Because know this. How much we have in the bank when we die is not going to matter. What kind of car you have when you die is not going to matter. 
What kind of cars you've had through your life isn't going to matter. I don't know if you really did it, but Pastor Phil is responsible for our trip going to Florida. And I'm just going to tell you, if there are any pictures of me in an electric car, it's his fault. (laughs) None of that stuff's going to matter in time when we stand before God. What matters is what you did. And by the way, some people will get these plates that we prayed for and and our expression of how God's provided for us where people put money in those things. It should not matter in this place one iota what anybody else thinks what we do there. It isn't about any other human being. It has to be about God. But money is just a representation of life. What about your very reasons for living? Are you living with a passion that has God in view? So this morning, Pastor Phil announced these sheets. I'm a, you know, I don't, I don't know that you get extra credit for reading your Bible through in a year with God. But some of you maybe have never re- read the Bible all the way through, and I think you should. I think you should. I think I should. It isn't a contest. I don't care if you get done in a year or not. This is the way I use this sheet. I start, and I may not start in Genesis. It doesn't start in Genesis on this sheet. But wherever I read, I cross off where I've read, and I'll tell you the benefit of it. Not only does it tell me what I've read, but it tells me where to go next if I forgot. And it tells me what I haven't covered yet. And I still read passages. You know the joy that I had preaching a couple weeks ago? Is that in my study and preparing for those messages on the incarnation, I learned lots of stuff. But pastor, you've been pastoring for 30 years, so what? I'm still growing just like you. And I need my Bible just like you. Now, I can tell you one thing I can't do. I can't, I can't give one of these to Monty and say, Monty, you be my accountability partner because as soon as I do it with Monty, it's about Monty and not God. I can't do that. You might do, if you do that, great. I'm not condemning a partner. I'm just saying, for me, that isn't about what anybody else thinks. It's about walking with the Lord yourself. And all I'm saying, I've been saved these now many years and I still need the Lord just as much today as I needed him yesterday and I'll need him the same way tomorrow. So if you want to read through your Bible, Have a plan, have a passion, and do it. And let God help you grow. Now, in this passage, and for those that have notes and following along with me, I'm going to burn pretty quickly through this next section because I want to get to the purpose. Verse 2 says, with all lowliness and meekness, with long suffering, forbearing one another in love. I actually took time in the message to break all that out as if we were going to spend time there. But... Forbearing with all loneliness or having all loneliness of mind simply means humility. Do we need humility? Yes. Meekness is a mild disposition. It has the idea of not being angry. Long suffering means exactly that, suffering long. We might think patience. Forbearing is an interesting word because it has two different directions it could go, but it means to hold up. Very often forbearing in the word hold up as it's defined, we often can think of it as going, coming along somebody else and holding them up. But I would say, I don't think that's what it means. To hold up means it holds up under the pressure. Forbearing means it holds up when it's not easy. It continues to stand when it's hard. And that is one towards another. In other words, have you ever known Christians to not be loving by your interpretation? Are you with me? And sometimes have Christians truly, in every which way you look at it, not been loving to you? Maybe so. And it's at that point that many Christians decide to become unbiblical and say, well, I've got every reason to be upset. I'm justified in my bitterness or anger. And here I sit. And you know as well as I know that that's not God's plan for your life. But to forbear means to hold up under that pressure 
and you're going to see the target as we keep going here, says forbearing one, there it is, one another, how? In love. Do any of us deserve the love of God? Does any, do any of us really deserve the love of any other person? Well, there are a lot of people who think they deserve a lot of things. But the truth is none of us deserves anything. But God says that the motivation to do these things has to be about him, walk worthy of him, and in a disposition of love towards brothers and sisters in Christ. So much so that he spends the whole next several verses talking about unity, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. Verse 4, Ephesians chapter 4, there's one body, one spirit, even as you are called, and one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all, and every bit of that is meant to target, you are a family in Jesus. But unto every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Verse 8, wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. He's going to talk about that giftedness. But now that he ascended, what is it but that he also descended first into the lower parts of the earth? He that descended is the same also that ascended up far above all heavens, that he might fill all things. And what you have here is what's going to come into the passage that I would say we famously go to that drives a lot of the methodology of Fellowship Baptist Church. What God is doing in the church through his people for his glory. And how we do and why we do what we do. So that drives us to purpose. We have to purpose what we're going to do. And I'm going to give you these, these two quick banners. The purpose to sum up is the glory of God and to edify under the banner of loving God's people. So the glory of God and to build up under the banner of edify loving God's people. These are targets of the purpose that God has given. Now, I've said this in many ways throughout the year. Be a builder, not a breaker. Now, I, you can't control what other people do. And I, there are times that I, I'm surprised personally that someone will put me in the context of being a breaker. Why? Because I don't want to be. And I'm going to do everything I can not to be a breaker. As a sinner still needing God's help, Absolutely, I can fail. But we as Christians need to have high on our target list of being those who edify. Now, here's what I'm going to do in Ephesians 4, 11 through 16. You know this passage. I'm going to read it to you, and then I'm going to anchor on a couple things. You've heard it many times. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, I'm going to read. And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Why? For the perfecting or the maturing of the saints, to what end? For the work of the ministry, and here it is, for the edifying of the body of Christ, the building up of that body. Till we all come in the unity, and here's that unity that was given before, till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Is it God's desire that everyone in this room is unified in knowing Christ as Savior? Absolutely. Unto a perfect man, and to what? ruler unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. The effect of this is that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and the cunning craftiness whereby they lie and wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head Next two words, even Christ. But edification, find it again in verse 16. It's in verse 12, it's in verse 16. From whom the whole body, Jesus, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth according to the effectual working in the measure of every part maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. So what's the target? Jesus and loving, and specifically in this passage, building up of the body of Christ under the banner of love of God. Now, the building of the body is, I think it's also evangelistic, bringing people into the body through the gospel, but it is also certainly building up the body that is here. So I'm going to give you two major things and I'm done. 
So technically, I finished the message two minutes before 12. <laughs> technically. So folks, I just want to, I want to give you some things here. So this, this is what I mean about this message being pastoral. Um, you, you, I'm, not, I'm not being Joel Osteen here by, by saying this is true that you're made on purpose. And God loves you and God has gifted you on purpose. Now, outside of the gospel, again, he wants you to know him. But if you know him, you are not peripheral to the work of God. You are integral to the work of God. Now, this is what I'm burdened about. And as we look at 2024, I at least want you to hear my burden. I know it's Pastor Phil's and we've been talking about this. We're taking steps. I'm going to tell you a little bit about that. Historically, this is what happened. I went away this last year to preach at other churches. And while I'm looking at other churches and preaching at other churches, I'm traveling a lot. It gives me a lot of time to think, right, Monty? It gives you time to think and to pray and seek what God is doing. And here's, here's one of the things that I believe that God wants us to be. Everybody who knows Jesus as their Savior is called something in the Bible. It's in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. We are disciples of Christ. Now, who is a disciple of Christ? Anybody who knows Jesus. Are we on the same page? Are we all in agreement? A disciple of Jesus is one who's followed Jesus, knows him as their savior, that qualifies them as a disciple of Christ. Now, we further know that a disciple of Christ is someone who does, who does what with Jesus? They follow him. What he says, I will do. Where he sends, I will go. How he leads, I will follow. Is the life of a disciple. That's what a disciple is. But did you know that God did not stop there? He not only calls all of his children to be disciples, followers of Christ, but he calls all of his children to be disciple makers. And this is my burden. My burden, and not just mine, but I think many of us, and I think we'll be on the same page with this, Pastor Phil, as, as we've talked. We believe that that message of being disciple makers needs to be identified. It needs to be clarified. And it needs to be implemented in our ministry where it is attainable, doable, achievable by God's people. Because that's what God's called. Now, by the way, when I say this, I'm not saying that nobody's doing this. But I want us to be on purpose as a church with what we're doing, that we're actually not only being disciples of Christ, but disciple makers. And one of those other major influences that has come over this past year in preaching in other churches and in watching this happen and looking at the doctrine of, of the word is understanding what our role is in the church. And it's frankly not that complicated and we need to uncomplicate it. God had a task for you to do when you came. He actually had several. We came here to worship him. But in that worship, I also want you to know that everybody has a task who knows Christ every Sunday. And that is to, I'm going to say it in more layman's language, make this place better to the glory of God because of you. Now, the biblical language of that is to edify. So when you wonder, what do I do? You have a job. And everybody has that job. Edify, build, strengthen, encourage, help, strengthen the body of Christ. And that's our target. Now, with that being said, and this is just a small segment here, um, but just to let you know, um, Pastor Phil and I have been praying over our, uh, observing and praying over our, our children's ministry, and not just children's ministry, but our Tuesday night ministry, and, and, and it's not just that aspect of our ministry, but holistically, but as an application, we're targeting the Tuesday night to try to change the structure of what we're doing to implement these purposes. 
And these purposes and the passion that drives them is the doctrine behind them. And that is that we would all have a path to being a disciple maker. That we'd actually invest in other people's lives and know them and minister to them and to give you a strategy and a way in which we can do that. And it's not the only way, but it's one of the ways that we'll do that and that'll largely have impact on how we meet both from adults to children on Tuesday nights. So it doesn't mean that True Trackers by name uh, will end, but it does mean there's going to be a, a shift in how we've done it. Now, uh, and, and by the way, my child doesn't win the day in this, okay? So I listen to a lot of people, and but my experience doesn't mean that because this is my experience, it's everybody's experience, and he's not in here to hear this, and he doesn't know it yet. Um, but I've had a couple times, and I've followed him. I've had a couple times when... Uh, I've been with him and I've, I, I've heard testimony of it. But when it comes to verse time, this is my six-year-old. When I watched him for the first time doing verse time in, in um, True Trackers, he must have said at least 10 times, do I get my prize? Do I get my prize? Do I get my prize? So he's willing to say the verse, but what is he after? Yeah, and it is, you know, that can be a good thing. We don't think all prizes are bad. Another, another family member came up to us with, with my Joe, helping Joe on a different night, and he said, I love your son. And I said, oh, what do you do? <laughs> and he said, he, said, he said to me several times, very clearly and very distinctly, I'll do whatever it takes to get the prize. <laughs> now, I th again, we're not saying we'll never have prizes, but what we're trying to do is actually change some of that culture. And understand, I don't think that that's wicked, but I, I, and I don't think it's evil or sinful, but I, I, in, in the core of who I am, I think there's a better reason. And I want that better reason. And we're going to go on this journey together, humbly, meekly, but it's going to be under the banner of discipleship. And really, what that means is as leaders stepping into these children's lives and actually having the leaders not just listen to their verses, but actually teach the kids their verses and memorize their verses with them. And in that time, which has normally been to listen to their memory verses, it's a time to unpack, to further explain, and to disciple those kids. And that's everyone who's involved in that ministry. But I'm telling you, it's not just our kids. We want that same culture in this group. We as God's people should be growing in the word of God together. And there's a way we can do it. It's not going to be the only way. But you're hearing this passion from us as pastors because it's undergirded with doctrine and because we want to be purposeful with what we're doing. And by the way, to be clear, uh, I have huge appreciation for all that's happened already to get us where we are because that's given us experience and a platform to build from. But what I'm asking you to do now as a church family is to be in prayer about these things with us. And really what you're hearing me as a pastor say is, will you go there with us? And will we purpose and have a passion and have a plan to do these things for the glory of God? And having asked that question, you know, I turn to the Lord and I say, Lord, please help us.